Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Commissioner's meeting. This is a public meeting that is being aired live on our local cable television station, QAC-TV7. These media broadcasts provide county citizens an opportunity to watch and review our scheduled public meetings. In addition to our live audience this evening, we are providing remote options for citizens to watch uh, county commissioner meetings. Citizens may watch our meeting live on our website at qac.org slash live or our television channel, Breeze Line Channel 7 and High Definition Channel 507. We acknowledge everyone's participation and by attending you acknowledge that this session is both recorded and aired. Press and public comment will be taken and is limited to three minutes per person. If you do care to speak, please sign the uh, sheet on the table in the corner over there. Comments longer than three minutes can be submitted in writing for the commissioner's review at any time. We will now stand and be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Commission President Jim Moran. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, folks, uh, I'm Todd Mon, the county administrator, and the purpose of tonight's hearing is to review the county commissioner's proposed FY 2025 operating and capital budgets. So uh, with, with me here today is uh, our county board of county commissioners. So introducing them from, uh, from your left to right, uh, we have Jack Wilson, District 1, Phil Duminell, District 3, our commission board president, Jim Moran, in the center, Chris Corcorino, District 4, and Patrick McLaughlin, District 2. So we have a, a short presentation that provides a basic high-level overview of the proposed FY 2025 budget. We have a, uh, a lot more of details, and the entire budget is on our, our webpage. You can see the website link there on the, on the bottom of this first slide. If you want to get into more details about the budget, uh, whether it's operating capital, uh, special revenue accounts, enterprise accounts, you can find all the details on our webpage. So I encourage everybody to uh, take a look at that if they want some more details. And then um, following the presentation, we will be receiving public comments. And as I mentioned, we do have the sign up sheet over in the corner on the uh, table by the door. Okay, so I'll begin. So just a few introductory points. Uh, this budget continues to provide sound financial management to deliver responsible public services to all the residents uh, with a conservative and balanced budget. We continue to invest in our public safety programs, public education, preservation of essential public infrastructure, and our committed workforce to deliver all of these essential services. This budget reflects the recommendations from our Spending Affordability Committee which include compliance with our policies on debt management, maintenance of our fund reserves, which include rainy day and revenue stabilization reserves, use of our fund balance and PAYGO funds to reduce our capital debt, and to maintain a strong financial condition with reasonable and responsible long-term capital planning. Our budget is also very consistent with our very coveted county AAA bond rating from our rating agencies in New York City. Some highlights here this evening um, of our FY25 budget. Our tax rates remain the same as the prior two years. Property tax rate will stay at 83 cents per $100 of assessed value. This will be the third year at that rate. Income tax rate will also be remaining the same at 3.2%. Our budgeted growth is 4.1% uh, over the current year. So we'd be, we'll be going from 183.6 million to 190. 1.2 million from FY24 to FY25. Our revenue is comprised primarily of income tax and property tax, which make up nearly 88% of our total county revenue sources. Our income tax is projected to grow by 3.3%, and our property tax is projected to grow by 6.5% over the FY24 budget. This slide is a graphical representation of the real property tax rates by county throughout Maryland and Baltimore City. You can see we are at the low end of the scale. We're the yellow bar at 83 cents per $100 of assessed value. We're the only uh, county with a lower rate is Talbot County. 
And you can see uh, all the way to the other end of the chart, um, Baltimore City is over $2 uh, per $100 of assessed value, 224 actually, 224.8. So we are very proud of, of our lower tax rate here in Queen Anne's County. Some operating highlights, uh, we are welcoming the return of the Public Housing Authority as a county government department after a 12-year hiatus. We've included funding for our volunteer fire departments and ambulatory providers. We're continuing support for the expansion of broadband services throughout the county. So we're investing in our public fiber network to include the long driveway grant program. And we are welcoming the additional internet service providers and television providers countywide uh, to provide competition for those services. We've increased support for Chesapeake College, our public library system, and our court system. And our budget does include funding for continuing commitments to support our dynamic workforce, critical staff positions, and employee recruitment and retention actions. We've also included PAYGO funding to our capital projects account uh, at $3 million for FY25. Some highlights for the Board of Education for FY25. We've locally funded the Board of Education at 73.9 million, which is 5 million above the FY24 allocation. It's also 5.8 million above the enrollment-based maintenance of effort uh, calculation. This is our second consecutive year of a 7% increase to the Board of Education operational budget. We've also allocated uh, nearly 14 million above the MOE calculations over the past three years combined. On the capital side, our Board of Education projects total uh, 14.8 million, which is 52% of all of our overall capital county projects budgeted for and allocated funding for for FY25. Some additional projects included in the six year plan include the Centerville Middle School, Mattapique Middle School roof replacement, uh, various uh, schools for furniture replacement and multi-school HVAC replacements. Okay, this pie chart shows the revenue by source, just to give you a pictorial perspective of the uh, revenue streams that we anticipate for FY25. You can see uh, income tax, the blue sector, and property tax, the red sector, comprise the majority of all of our revenue streams at 44% for income tax and 43% for property tax. This slide shows the actual numeric values of the uh, revenue streams by, uh, by, by section. Uh, we have the FY23 actual values across the top. We have the FY24 adopted budget values. You can see the FY25 proposed budget values for our revenues, and then the change in the last column over to the uh, right, uh, the change between FY24 and 25. And at the top of the chart, you see the uh, real property and income taxes at 82.6 and 83 million respectively. Uh, part way down, you can see the, oops, the um, recordation and transfer taxes at 6.5 and 2.3 million. They are slightly down because uh, as of new, ho new home sales are, are declining a bit and interest rates are, are up, so they, we are seeing a drop off there, but we are seeing an increase in, um, in our income, interest income as a result of funding we have in the bank, so that's offsetting some of that. But at the bottom of the, um, uh, the column there, in, uh, column three, shows the total amount of 191.2 million, and which is a $7.6 million increase over the FY24 adopted budget. All right, this pie chart shows um, the corresponding expense by function. This is where the money gets allocated or is allocated uh, for the FY25 program. The blue sector is the Board of Education at 42%. Uh, the next largest sector over at um, 9 o'clock is a group of other agencies that we provide funding for. That includes our uh, Office of the Sheriff, our court system, our public library, uh, Board of Elections, State's Attorney, Social Services, and some others at 17%. The next highest group is our public safety down at 6 o'clock, which is our um, Detention Center and Department of Emergency Services. They come in at 12%, followed by Public Works, which has a variety of divisions, which we'll, we'll cover here shortly, at 7%, and then County Administration at 5%. So the next series of slides is similar to the, uh, the revenue 
slide which shows all of the county departments, agencies, outside groups, and it shows again the FY23 actual values, the adopted budget for 24, our current year, our proposed budget for FY25, and the change. So the first group includes the overall county administration, which includes our county commissioners, uh, our legal teams, um, my office, the uh, budget and finance group, our information technology group, human resources, economic development and tourism, our QAC TV7 crews, and community fairs. We've allocated $10.3 million for this group. The next group is uh, community services, which includes our Department of Aging, Housing and Community Services, the Local Management Board, and our new newcomer agency, the Public Housing Authority. So that comes in at $4.5 million. At the bottom here, we have the Planning and Zoning Department, a standalone department, just shy of $3 million for FY25. The next group is the Public Safety Group, which includes our Detention Center and Department of Emergency Services. They come in at uh, $22.8 million. Next, we have the Public Works Department, which has a variety of agencies, including Animal Services, Engineering, General Services, our Roads Department, Solid Waste, and Property Management. And they come in at uh, $14.3 million for FY25. Next, we have Parks and Recreation, which also includes the Bay Bridge Airport and the Blue Heron Golf Course, which are uh, enterprise accounts at uh, $6.8 million for FY25. Next, we have the Board of Education at the top of this chart uh, at uh, $73.9 million for FY25, which is a $5 million increase over the current year. Then we have our other agency group that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it includes uh, um, the State's Attorney, the 4-H Park, Sheriff's Office, Chesapeake College, our FEC group, Fire and Rescue Protection, uh, Fire and Rescue Protection volunteer groups, uh, fire services, uh, soil conservation, a number of agencies there that we fund at uh, $32.3 million. Then we have some debt service accounts for the broken down by the Board of Education and general county government for debt service payments for projects that have been completed over the past uh, 15 years. Then we have a couple other categories, which includes our uh, general insurances, uh, benefits, other post-employee benefits, grants, salaries, and contingencies. That comes in at $7.7 .7 million. And then lastly, we have some transfers to the capital fund I mentioned earlier with uh, $3 million going over to capital and ag transfers and fire impact fees. And that totals $3.2 million for a total general fund operation budget of $191.2 million. Okay, so that, that's basically the uh, high-level view of the operations budget. Now we'll talk a little bit about our capital budget for FY25. Uh, you'll see here, this is, uh, this, these are the out years we plan for. There's more detail in our, on our website as, as far as the projects that we've programmed. I will mention a few as we go through these. The first group is our outside agency group at uh, 2.7 million. This includes allocations to the volunteer fire companies 4-H Park improvements, which is underway now. We're doing a really a rehabilitation at 4-H Park. Hopefully you can come to the fair this year, but it's going to be very, very nice. We also have included an allocation for a new, the new regional hospital, which is in Talbot County near the community center. We've allocated $1.25 million, $1 million and $5 million over four years to support that effort going forward. Uh, construction is going to be FY 27-28 if things stay on track. So a project we, uh, we very desperate, desperately need in, in our region. Next, we have the Administration and General Services Group. This includes uh, $2.2 .2 million in FY25 for um, county facility maintenance, general maintenance, Liberty Building Maintenance, HVAC, renovation of our EMS Station 400, and a new roof at the Health Department in Centerville. Next, we have uh, Animal Services. We have $130,000 allocated for FY25. And you'll see some, some larger allocations in the out years uh, for planning and potentially construction of a new animal services uh, facility, which is currently located in Queenstown. Detention Center is the next project. We have uh, 580000 for planning and design of a new regional detention center uh, south of Church Hill. And uh, we have allocated funding for, my fingers are a little bigger than this 
controller. Um, some allocations here for the construction of the new regional detention center in uh, FY 27 and 28 for $24.8 million. Next, we have uh, emergency services, $1.5 million for additional ambulances, replacements, our public safety network, and our radio subscriber replacements for our two-way radio systems for our volunteers and emergency services providers. Next, we have the information and communication technology section, roughly $2 million in FY25 for continuing to support our IT infrastructure and our public fiber expansion infrastructure network. Our public libraries, we have $100,000 in FY25 program for improvements at the Centerville Library Branch. Our Recreation Department, we've got a quarter million in FY25 for the continuation of the planning and design study for a new rec center. Uh, we don't have a location for that yet, but that uh, planning and design effort is underway now. And we have some allocations here for, excuse me, for the um, construction of that facility in FY26 and 27. Department of Aging, we have uh, 590,000 for a replacement large transit vehicle, renovations, continuing renovations at our Kramer Center, which is situated in Centerville, and a new senior center camera system at 120,000. Next, we have the Board of Education, uh, $14.4 million for major projects in FY25 for the Board of Education, which include the new Board of Education Administration Building, which is uh, underway now situated uh, on Vincent Street across from the county office building, camera system conversions, fire alarm replacements at Queen Anne's High, classroom furniture replacements, playground equipment at Sullersville Elementary School, new stadium field lighting replacement at Queen Anne's High, some storm sewer and uh, stormwater management repairs at Kent Island High, floor replacements at Mattapique Middle, new community-based ba health suites at Kennard and Stevensville Middle Schools, and a new sidewalk leading from the middle school in Centerville to the YMCA Senior Center in Centerville. Our Parks Department has 2.8 million programmed in FY25 for the continuation of various trail development projects, maintenance of those trails and various amenities, uh, general pedestrian bridge maintenance, and the restoration of uh, Ferry Point Park. Our roads division includes um, $9.4 million for additional replacement capital equipment, dump trucks and heavy equipment, asphalt overlays for our roads system pres preservation program, 2.3 million, which is the lion's share, a new connector road leading from uh, the Mattapique area up to the Target Shopping Center on Kent Island, replacement bridges at Nichols Manor and Ackerman Road in Cloverfields, and general bridge maintenance at 600,000. Lastly, we have our sanitary district, which is our water and sewer division, uh, nearly $7 million in FY25. Largely, this is going to be the Southern Kent Island Sanitary Sewer Extension Project. We're in phase four of, of four, uh, $5 million for that. We also have program capital equipment replacement and a re upgrades to our Graysonville water treatment plant, which is located in uh, Graysonville behind the school in, uh, in Graysonville. So overall, we have $45.2 million in our total capital budget for FY25. This slide shows the funding sources for FY25 for those projects. Uh, oops. Uh, across the bottom of the chart here, we've got the three million in PAYGO, nearly $5 million in grants, $12 million in bonds, uh, $1.8 million in operating funds, $15.4 million from capital fund balance, $8 million of other funding, which largely is um, special benefit assessments for the uh, Route 8 sewer project. But those customers that get connected pay that, that special benefit back for the total of $45.3 million overall for our FY25 capital budget. And again, uh, our capital budget, our entire budget, you can um, review that in, in greater detail uh, by clicking on that uh, web link there. All right, this last uh, graphic here, slide, shows our overall six-year capital plan by department and agency. Uh, this is a very high-level roll-up of all the summaries. This show, oops, I need a bigger controller next time. My hands are just too big for this. The, um, this shows all the departments, 
This is the funding year that we're talking about, FY25. These are the planning years, FY26 through FY30. So you can see we've got $231 million in capital projects planned over the six-year time period, which includes the, uh, obviously includes our Board of Education, Parks, Library Systems, all of the departments we talked about. At the bottom section here, these are our enterprise accounts, which include public landings, the Bay Bridge Airport, Roads Board, and our Water and Sewer Division. So that's another $100 million on top of the 231. So we've, you can see we've got uh, $331 million in capital projects programmed over the next six years for Queen Anne's County. Okay, uh, our last slide just shows some upcoming dates. We're here at, for our third and final uh, presentation of the FY25 budget here at Sutlersville Middle School. It's great to be here. I'm glad to see uh, the audience participating as well. We do have a potentially a final budget work session scheduled for June the 4th. That will be at the Liberty Building in Centerville if we need that. And then we plan to adopt the final budget on June the 11th. So that concludes our presentation. And we can now receive public comment from folks that have signed up. And if you haven't signed up, we'll give you an opportunity to, at the end, to come up if you have some comments that you'd like to present to the commissioners. So I'll turn it over to uh, Commissioner Moran to come up to the microphone here in the center and just state your name and your point of interest. Dr. Salins is up first. Okay. Are you tired of seeing me yet? Not at all. Yeah. Don't answer that. Not Be nice. All. Good evening, Commissioners. Patty Salins, Superintendent. I live in Queenstown. And I just want to say thank you for giving the community three opportunities to come out and really share what's important to them. And I think that it was probably powerful for all of us. Um, and I really do appreciate your comments after um, no, each of. George, can you get her turned up? Can you turn her mic up or something? Uh, I also appreciate. Is that better? Is it turned on? Is that better? Is it on? Okay. Yeah, it's definitely. There, 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 there. Okay. Um, so I really do appreciate the comments at the end. And as a follow up from last night's comments, um, we are looking forward to sitting monthly with your financial team. And we, we want to be an open book. We want to be transparent. We feel like we've really tried to be transparent. And we will continue to make that commitment. We are partners. We do appreciate your support in every aspect from capital to operating and everything in between um, and everything you do for us as it relates to all the other things like our school resource officers, our parks and rec, a new grant from the local management board that's helping to support our after school programming. It all comes from you all. So thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. C.C. Mitchell. Oh, I gave you my real name. I know you did. Not handwriting. <laughs> Which is it, Sevilla? It's Cecilia. It's a oh, lot of vowels. Cecilia. I could never Breaking go on Wheel of Fortune. Right. It would cost me a fortune <laughs> to buy my name. Um, I'm Cecilia Mitchell. I'm the president of the Queen Anne's County Education Association. We have some members with us tonight. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak with you and tagging on what Dr. Salins has already spoken to over the last three nights. Thank you for everything. Um, we talked over the last nights about the importance of reading and math specialists and what they bring to us in terms of resources. They're also part of our leadership, kind of like our farm team, for leaders like Louisa Welch, who turn out to be principals, Kevin Kintop, as we go around the room. So that is an important aspect of the future of our schools as well. So whatever can be done to uh, preserve those positions, we would very much appreciate as a op professional opportunity for teachers and the richness that they bring our system overall. Um, speaking of staffing, um, thinking about some of the other things that folks said over um, the last two nights as it relates to class size. Um, the safety aspect in terms of hurting a lot of kids um, either out of the building for a fire drill or God forbid some other catastrophic event, those numbers have an impact on personal safety. So um, whatever can be done to preserve those classroom teachers as well. Kids day starts on the bus and those relationships are really important from the bus driver to the custodians to lunch ladies paras secretaries the list goes on we are the largest employer in the county there are a lot of people that go into making a school system run and it's based on relationships 
Um, and if there's anything we learned from COVID, is that those relationships are personal relationships, like being able to look somebody right in the eye, pat them on the back, comfort them. Oh, Miss Mitchell, I need a hug. Well, come here, baby. I got you. It's okay. Um, as opposed to leaving a meet open all day Wednesday, because that kid's home alone. You know, when we were we were stuck at home. Um, but that takes people. So whatever you can do to preserve those people and preserve the quality of our school, school system in the future of our community would be, I don't know where the clock is, by the way. It's right on okay. the desk over here. All right, thank you. Um, uh, there's an electrical shock, you'll know. I'll jump, I'm very reactive. Um, and I think that's it, but just as an advocate for our labor force, whatever you can do, we would much appreciate um, thank you for everything. Oh, and one more thing. We talked, oh, no, don't, is that a whistle that I need to stop? Oh, no, it's a baby. Um, <laughs> that those relationships are important, not just in a classroom or in a school building, but with you and with our board. And I worked hard to try and make that a positive relationship. And um, we have a really nice office and a uh, little office in Centerville. We can have a coffee, um, but let's get together and continue the conversation. So thank, thank you. you for everything. Janice Oliver. I thought I was farther down the list. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Janet Salazar, the director for the Queen Anne's County Public Library, and I'm here to thank you once again for your ongoing support and funding for the Queen Anne's County Library. Um, the increased funds for our programming show your commitment to creating a lively center for learning and discovery in our community. And by supporting educational initiatives and cultural events, you help promote lifelong learning and intellectual curiosity. By adding a 3D printer to our mobile library, that's a big step toward encouraging innovation and creativity, especially in our little ones, and in those communities that don't have a library branch near them. So I just want to sincerely thank you for your funding of the library, and I appreciate your help and getting the library to support and fulfill our mission to invite innovation, inspire curiosity, and build community. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Steve Wilson, Centerville, Maryland, uh, speaking tonight once again for the Spending Affordability Commission, the Finance Advisory Commission to the County Commissioners. Um, uh, the Affordability Commission has examined this budget with considerable care and all members of it resolutely approve and, uh, and back the uh, budget as proposed. Uh, I think it's a very even-handed and, and uh, generous budget, and uh, we're in full support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Louisa Welch. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners. Louisa Welch, um, living here in, uh, near here in Churchill. Um, I spoke to you uh, Monday evening, uh, listened to the presentation last night. Um, when I spoke Monday evening, I had a whole sheet of stuff and I didn't time it very well. So when I listened to the thoughts last night uh, that people shared, uh, I was moved to come back again to speak. So I appreciate again the time um, that you make uh, available to the public for that. Um, I was moved to share, particularly Mr. Moran, because you, you mentioned the Blue Ribbon Schools, which are near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Bayside was um, yeah. the first blue, state Blue Ribbon School in a very long time. I think the only other Blue Ribbon School we had was uh, Stevensville Middle. Um, and if I can brag just a second, I think we were the very first national Blue Ribbon School. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very happy to see that other schools in the county you know, have been recognized. And I just have to say, I know, you know what I spoke about before was my passion for the reading and math specialists and protecting them. And ultimately, it's my job to provide what those kids need in the building every day, to keep them safe, to keep them learning, to focus on student achievement. But I have to say, honestly, and I'm not being overly dramatic about this, I do not think that we would have reached the level of receiving a Blue Ribbon Award if I had not had the positive programming effects of the reading and math specialist. 
I really feel strongly about the professional development they provide for our teachers, the support they provide, the reading and math interventions, and we personally received that Blue Ribbon Award for the growth that we made in our free and reduced meal students. And I can tell you for sure, as sure as I'm standing here, a major part of our ability to move those students was the data analysis that they helped me with. Now, I'm, we're gonna make it happen, either way. I'm gonna do my job. But I'm gonna tell you that it will dramatically affect my ability to do my job if I don't have those positions. I certainly appreciate your support. Um, again, I'm not lost on the fact that you have really supported us financially, that you are supporting us above the maintenance of effort level. I, I understand that. I'm simply sharing selfishly that those people are super important to how well I'm able to do my job. And they make us look good, and they help kids. And uh, so I sincerely and humbly again ask you to consider the funding to reinstate those positions. Thank we, you. We Appreciate have one it. of those people, Margie, but she's not here tonight. Yeah. So. They make it work. Yeah, that's yep. right. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Michelle McNeil. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Michelle McNeil and I'm a resident, graduate, parent, and educator of Queen Anne's County. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude for the support you have continuously provided to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I understand the challenges involved in allocating a budget among the various crucial agencies within our county. Tonight, I'm here to highlight the critical role of reading and math specialists, particularly at Sellersville Elementary School, where I serve as the principal. Our school, which accommodates 311 students, currently has 125 students enrolled in reading interventions and 98 students in math interventions. Additionally, we have 88 students who are learning English as a second language, all whom benefit significantly from these interventions. Without the specialists, we would be forced to reduce the number of students receiving additional reading and math support by at least 75%. This drastic reduction would severely impact our students' ability to meet grade level standards. The absence of these specialists would place an even greater burden on our dedicated teachers who are already investing extra hours and effort to support our students daily. The essential support provided by the specialists is not just about meeting academic benchmarks, it's about ensuring each student has the opportunity to succeed. I respectfully request that you consider allocating additional funds to education so we can continue to provide our students with the necessary support to become successful graduates of Queen Anne's County. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Rachel Wagner. Hello, my name is Rachel Wagner and I am the math specialist at Southersville Elementary School. First, I want to thank the commissioners for the continued support that you've shown QACPS over the years, and we greatly appreciate the large amount of money that we are already being given to help support our budget crisis this year. That being said, I'm sorry that we're in the predicament that we're in and having to be up here asking for more money, but I feel very strongly that our students need the support of the reading and math specialists in elementary schools. This is where we lay the groundwork for the rest of their educated lives and foster the love for learning that we will take, they will take with them throughout their life. I came to Southersville Elementary School in 2015 after bouncing from school to school as, at, as most teachers in DC do. I said in my interview that I was looking for my forever school because I didn't want to bounce around anymore. I wanted to be in a place where I could watch my students grow from year to year and see familiar friendly faces in the hallways. I found that at SES. When I became the math specialist three years ago, I felt that I could help this school that I love so much in a different way, and it's been great. I'm able to see students who would otherwise fall through the cracks and support their learning through interventions. I also continue to push the students to their potential who require enrichment services. I don't only support the students, but the teachers as well. I provide resources to help them accommodate for students in their classroom and give professional development throughout the year. This helps them to differentiate for all learners, learn creative new ways to engage their students, and understand the ins and outs of the curriculum. Unfortunately, looking forward to next year, we will see many changes. This includes inevitably larger class sizes and lacks, lack of additional supports in the building. We'll lose tutors who, will be, who, would, who were paid under grants that will lo no longer exist, building subs, and have less teachers per building. This alone is a huge loss for our school community. If we lose our school specialists in addition to this, the impacts will be much greater. Picture this. I'm a first grade teacher in a classroom with 28 new faces. 
much bigger than my previous class size. Some of these students are non-English speakers and may be brand new to our country. Others may have special needs and require more social emotional assistance. As an elementary classroom teacher specifically, I'm teaching many subjects each day, up to 12 plans a day, five days a week. As we know, every child is different in their needs and struggles, and they vary from student to student. In previous school years, I would have tutors and specialists to come in and support my learners who need additional support, as well as enrichment and small groups that would be much smaller, allowing me to do more quality one-on-one -on -one time with all of my students to address their personal needs and growth. However, this not, may not be the case for next year. We already lost some of our tutors and additional support in the classroom. This leaves us now with our specialists as support. But without your endorsement, we will not have them either. I could stand here and continue to share the dramatic impact that it would have on me personally for next year and how much, difficult, how much more difficult and time-consuming this tough job would become. But at the end of the day, our students in Queen Anne's County Public Schools would have the greatest impact. Our students would no longer have any intervention or enrichment groups aside from what their general education classroom teachers can provide. I ask you to please consider helping our schools even more with the extra money to keep the math and reading specialists in the elementary level. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm the math specialist, and we have um, 98 students in our in our intervention slash enrichment programs. Um, I see some of them. I oversee the tutors and all of the resources provided in order to be giving the other groups that I am not able to see the intervention that they need as well. And you say you've been here for three years. I've been here for 10 years. I've been the math specialist for three years. Oh, okay. All right. And you live in the county? Yeah, I live in Centerville. Thank you. No, no, the tutor, uh, he asked if the tutors were volunteers or parents or other assistants and things like that. Um, no, the tutors are, we have um, uh, an ESSER tutor, which would be the grant that uh, we, no longer, we would no longer have. Um, we have one Title I part-time tutor and one full-time uh, Title I tutor, and that's kind of it. So it's between us and then them, so that would, we wouldn't have the Title I, I mean, we wouldn't have the ESSER tutor, which would be a grant that we no longer have, and then, um, you know, who knows about Title I always in that budget. I'm sorry, say it again. I, the, the reason I ask is my daughter's a senior and she tutors ninth, 10th, and 11th graders in geometry or pre-calc or whatever it is. Yeah, there's and definitely- it, it, It's just a great uh, motivation for the older kids to, to spend time with the younger kids. So yeah, I there's, just, there's I definitely- I was just curious. There's definitely peer support that we have and, and we can use, um, but I feel like, I, you know, they're fourth graders, as old as our school gets, so um, it's sometimes hard for a fourth grader to know how to teach, you know, the younger students, or even have time in their, in their day. But the high schooler would be able to have time in their schedule to come right. to our schools? Yeah, that, we would take them. <laughs> we would take them. Um, but I think ours is that we would have to then provide the resources. So, thank you. Thank you. Katie. Good evening. He's making you speak or is he going to come up? He's next. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sat here quiet yesterday, so I'm just making sure. Okay. I know. <laughs> um, my name is Katie Lang. I am a resident of Centerville and I am a 21 year teaching veteran here in Queen Anne's County. I am currently the special education chairperson at Kennard Elementary School, um, overseeing the special education department that services about um, 60 students with IEPs and another 30 students with 504 plans. Um, it is imperative in my job that we have the math and reading specialist positions. Um, last night, Mr. Wilson, you asked Dr. Salins about, um, you know, would those people lose their position? You know, they're not going to lose their job. They'll have a job. We can put them in classrooms. We're not going to change class size, but we're going to lose that job and what they do. And I know you just heard a little bit about what they do, um, but from my standpoint as a special educator, um, the reading and math specialists are imperative to collecting data so that we are able to identify students who might have a special needs disability that requires special education services. And if we don't have 
a math specialist and a reading specialist helping to provide those interventions, helping our classroom teachers determine um, you know, different strategies that might need to be tried in the classroom or some different resources to use to help coach the classroom teachers. If we don't have them in our buildings, the classroom teacher is gonna end up, instead of going to the reading and math specialist, they're gonna end up on my doorstep looking for support through the special education department. And your special education students cost more than your general education students uh, because it's a general educator, but also a special educator. Sometimes a paraeducator is needed. Um, so I'm just asking that you please do support um, the Board of Ed this year with that extra money that's needed to fund those positions so we can keep them. I was at last night's meeting. There are definitely some things that were discussed last night that I agree with. Um, I definitely think, as Dr. Salins already spoke to, that some transparency between the Board of Ed and the commissioners is definitely needed to make sure that the budget is you know, appropriate and being used correctly. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, I understand not wanting to raise our property taxes to meet these needs, but the prices of everything are going up. So it's gotta come from somewhere. <laughs> um, and then also just, um, you know, I understand as a taxpayer, you can't keep the five million every year extra. I get that. So we need to figure out a solution. I just ask that you know next year, if we could keep things as they are so that we have time to plan and figure out what to do to make it better in the future. Um, but, but those math and reading specialists are absolutely imperative um, so that we don't over identify students with special needs and spend money that way. So thank you. Thank you. Ken Lang, Centerville, Maryland. Um, so it kind of feels like we're at a point where we're coming to the pharaohs to ask for what we need. So I think on this point, either you guys should be pretty upset because either the Board of Ed didn't ask you for what they actually needed to keep these positions, so now we're coming back to the table to ask for them, or we as voters should be upset with you for saying, no, nope, we know better, we're gonna say this is all you get, figure it out. But somewhere, somebody really should be a little bit on the upset side that we're even having to have this much. And I feel like you guys saw the writing on the wall that it was coming, because this year's letter that I got in the mail really highlighted the education budget really well compared to past years. That I think you guys knew that this was going to come. You got three meetings, you got all this, and really highlighted that. Um, you guys have done a great job, just board prior, prior boards, to supporting our education system in this county. And if we want the Blue Ribbon schools to continue, we want more of them. We want this high quality education. I, I lost the election for not being Republican enough, so I can say it. Last night, it was talked about up there, we can't change the, we can't ask for a tax rate increase. Everything comes from someplace. If we're gonna have our fire companies needing more for the trucks that cost more, our educators needing more, just to maintain the high quality, the high quality emergency services, the high quality parks, the high quality Queen Anne's County, unless y'all got a money tree someplace that we're par putting in our parks, we're gonna have to do it someplace. Do it before we all of a sudden gotta go up to a buck and a half to be able to pay for anything. Maybe we need to have that conversation. You guys can have it behind closed doors so you don't have to tell anybody about it yet. It can't be a never conversation. For us to be successful as Queen Anne's County residents, for what we want, I think I've seen a little satirical cartoon of what do we want? We want better schools. What do we want? We want better fire companies. What do we want? We want better this. We want better that. Who's gonna pay for it? And everybody walks out of the room. <laughs> we can't walk out of the room. That's why we elect you guys to step up in the room and do that. Sometimes that's a hard decision, but I think it's an important one, so that we don't have to come and be like, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, please help us keep these positions that we didn't know we were gonna cut if we didn't have that money. So if they didn't ask you for enough, I'd be upset with the Board of Ed if I was you guys. If they did ask you for enough, then voters, speak with your votes, because that's what's affecting our education system. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Melin Schriefer. Uh, I'm a 
former student, a current educator, and a parent of a future Q QACPS student. I have previously worked here at Southersville Middle School, and now I work across the street at Southersville Elementary School. Both of these schools are Title I schools, which can often allow for more needs to arise within our population. When beginning my educational journey here at Southersville Middle School, I was faced with teaching 66th graders ELA with no additional support from a reading specialist. That position was vacant. Having come to the county with five years of previous experience in elementary schools meant I knew the basics, but without re the reading specialist support, I was leaning solely on my teammates. The academic needs of my sixth graders lent itself to elementary methods of teaching due to many gaps. Had I had a reading specialist assistant, it would have helped me to create higher thinking tasks while helping me to meet my students at their lower ability levels. I now work at Sudlersville Elementary, which has both a reading and math specialist to assist me when needed. Havilink specialist has provided me with the resources needed to develop and instruct higher thinking tasks to accompany our already enriching curriculum. In the fourth grade this year for reading, we started with three students on grade level and 12 students three or more grade levels behind. In math, we started with four students on grade level and seven students three or more grade levels behind. You can see the gaps. We now have 12 students on grade level and only five students three or more grade levels behind in reading. And in math, we now have 29 students on grade level and only two that are three more grade levels below. These are commendable growths and I'm so proud of our students. But these growths only happen because of the additional supports that they receive from our specialists. As an educator, I fear with the impact that the budget proposes, interventions would be added to my current teaching demands and workload without the reading or math specialist guidance or their time. I urge you to think of the needs of our children as their current education will shape their future. Without strong educational foundations, your next doctors, lawyers, and your workforce will be severely lacking. I hope that you please consider giving the extra money to keep our futures bright, since Queen Anne's County Public Schools is where our futures begin. And again, thank you for your time. Hello, um, my name is Melanie Belford. Um, I want to start by thanking you for your continued support and already going ab above and beyond for our county. Making financial decisions that impact every resident is an extremely daunting task, and it does not go unnoticed. I am speaking you to you today as the reading specialist at Southersville Elementary and a parent whose child will be a product of Queen Anne's County. Therefore, I feel compelled to advocate for our future. I have experienced my education growing up in Illinois. I began te my teaching career in Florida and then moved to the Eastern Shore five years ago where I've been able to advance both personally and professionally that I would not have been able to in places I've lived before. The support for education and the attention to detail paid to building successful communities here is what has convinced my family to plant our roots here on the shore. We have been able to purchase our first home and bring our one-year-old son into this world due to the supportive services offered across all county expenditures. At the same time, my heart lies in education. As the reading specialist at Sudlersville Elementary School, I would like to explain the systemic impact the loss of reading and math specialists will have. I provide intervention, which is extra support, for 63 students daily. My position also guides and supports four tutors in their daily instruction of an additional 62 students. This means that 40% of our student body would not receive that intervention instruction with the loss of my current position. With our current intervention model, our school has moved from 7% of our students reading on grade level to 32% now reading on grade level. These figures only account for the area of reading, but there is an equally detrimental impact that would occur in math. In addition, in my position, I have been fortunate to receive specialized training in the, in the science of reading to meet the individual needs of each of these students. Our classroom teachers are exceptional, and they work many hours outside of school day to meet, meet each of those student needs, but they simply do not have the opportunities for training that the specialist positions allow. 
That being said, the system will falter with the elimination of social capital and wisdom that our specialists offer, not only in this community, but across the county. We sympathize with the effects outside of education that may occur due to any additional funding that would be granted, but we are appreciative for the opportunity for our voices to be heard. Please consider the impact your contributions may have to our futures by funding education. Thank you for your time. You can come up here. Come on. <laughs> Alexis Caves, this is my daughter Quinn. Uh, we live at Barclay Road in Marydale, Maryland. Um, so we are here tonight um, to just show our support for our reading and math specialist. Um, and first and foremost, I would just like to thank you guys for all your generosity, generosity you have given us thus far. Um, we appreciate it um, and everything that you do for the school systems. Um, the reading specialist, the math specialist, especially the reading, uh, is near and dear to our heart. So I'm sure just as everybody has experienced the losses in learning from COVID, um, my daughter fell way behind and for the past couple of years, um, she has definitely benefited and come out of her shell and has made huge strides and advancements from her reading specialist. Um, and you know, we come home and practice, but I can't even imagine where we'd be at now if you know, she didn't have the extra support that she gets at school. So did you want to read a little something? <laughs> Hi, my name is Quinn and my teacher was Mr. McNeil. He helped me improve on my reading. So this, I mean, she would never have been able to do this before or come out of her shell up here and talk in front of you guys. So um, I just want to show, your, show the support to everybody and just all the sentiments and everything, all the grandparents, educators, teachers, everyone that has echoed before me. Um, we just can't lose any of the reading and math specialists. It would be you know, a detriment to the kids who have already fallen so far behind from our COVID losses. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to mention while we were here. So I heard um, people mentioning the blueprint and asking a couple questions and comments. I would employ everyone, um, as I've heard some of you say before, to reach out at the state level. I mean, I hear everybody here talking and being vocal. I mean, you may think it's just one person, but you reach out and it will make a difference because uh, in theory, you know, the blueprint was supposed to be world-class education for Maryland students, but at what cost? Because they left out the part of funding. I mean, at this rate, a world-class education to me doesn't look like losing teachers. It doesn't look like increasing class sizes. It doesn't look like cutting programs, you know, music, art programs, and it doesn't look like bankrupting counties to me. So make your voices heard and you know, be loud. Everybody seems to be loud and can be loud with everything else. So um, that's a huge part. And as others have said before, you know, we're here now, but next year, the year after, what then? Where's the money going to come from? Because at some point, you know, nobody's going to have any money. Um, there is one more thing I would like to address. I heard a couple people, um, there's a lot of disinformation out there. And then when it gets on social media, it spreads like wildfire. So about 10% of the 100% of the stuff you read might be true, the rest isn't. Um, so I think if, um, as others have said before, there needs to be a lot of transparency and accountability. So um, I would think that the commissioners, the Board of Education and the public need to together, get together in just you know, a school-based work session or even you know, a town hall where people can openly talk and not have to ha give a three minute rush speech and not feel like they're getting answered. And then so people can learn where the budget's coming from, where the money's coming from, what mandates you know we're under because the blueprint is, there's a lot of mandates, but there's no money for them. So I just wanna thank everybody again and thank you for everybody who's come out and voice their opinions and um, thank you for keeping our schools funded. So thank you.
Hi, my name is Coral Adams. I live in Southersville. I teach in Southersville Middle School. Um, you'll have to excuse my unprofessional attire. I came straight here from my second job teaching yoga. So um, I am, as I said, teach in this building. Unfortunately, in Southersville Middle School, we have already lost our specialist positions, not because of funding, but because of an inability to bring in people to fill those positions. Um, we lost our reading specialist several years ago, as a um, Malin said before me. Our math specialist has moved into a teacher specialist position, so now, and for the past two years, we've had one. The real life in the building of what that looks like is one person is in charge of all of the math interventions, so all of our students that are two or more grades below are required by the blueprint to receive interventions to help close the gap. One person is in charge of all of that. Because that's not really possible, um, we have other teachers that are being pulled to do those positions. There's no one who's in charge of reading interventions. So Mr. Watkins has done amazing things, making amazing contraptions out of the strings and buttons left in the box, pulling people from uh, pulling retired teachers and enticing them to come back, pulling special educators to cover some of those positions, but the fact of the matter is that when a special educator is covering an intervention, they are not providing services for the students that they are legally required to provide services for. And that ends in lawsuits for the county because that is a legal requirement. The current teacher specialist, I wrote a list of all the things she did because I want to make sure that you understand what it looks like in the building. And I'm concerned and <laughs> really scared about who's gonna be doing this next year if we don't have, if we lose the one specialist that we have left in this building. Right now, she runs interventions. She assists in classrooms with students that are struggling. The same students that are in those interventions that are two or more years behind. If a student is two years behind in math, and they're functioning at the fourth grade level, they're not able to do math at the sixth grade level in their sixth grade math class. But legally, they have to be in that class. So our math specialist is the person that is helping to close that gap and provide some of the extra needed services there, the extra needed attention. She orchestrates plans and troubleshoots testing three times a year in middle school and elementary school. That is a insane, jigsaw puzzle of about 5,000 pieces and all of those pieces are human beings. <laughs> so reorchestrating the schedule, making sure that students are given the accommodations that they need. It's many, many student groupings. It can't just be done by the class, by their homeroom class. Teachers or students have to be grouped out and they can only be tested by certified teachers. So she has to figure out that huge puzzle three times a year. She um, monitors testing regulations and makes sure that we don't fall into a testing violation because there are many regulations and rules on how tests have to be given, who can give the test, rooms have to be inspected, papers have to be signed, and she does all of that. It's a full-time job. She does a lot of other things, but those are the things that are legally required by the state that she is currently doing. Other schools have multiple people doing this job. I don't know how she keeps doing it, but if I'm being realistic, I don't know how sustainable it is that she could keep doing it. Our tutors, our Title I tutors in addition, as I heard that they were brought up, are those people that are working with students who are not only showing a gap because of their, like a gap in their work, but are also working with our students in a Title I school who are having food insecurity, family insecurity, social emotional crises, um, home life issues that are causing them to fall behind in school. Our Title I tutor is able to pull those students and work with them one-on-one -on -one so they can get work caught up and they can be successful. Because if students are successful in middle school, then they go on to feel successful and feel like they can do something in high school. But if they're failing in middle school, statistically speaking, they don't make it through high school. So reading and math specialists, teacher specialists in our building are the thing that closes the gap. Point blank. Next year, someone will be doing these things. It will probably be classroom teachers. For me, that'll mean I have three preps. And I can tell you very honestly, there is no way that I can do as good of a job when I'm doing three classes and three preps with no extra planning time as someone who is only or predominantly focusing on the intervention. We're talking about the kids that are at the most need. And I, I have heard you guys talk about how the state mandated this, so the state needs to pay for it. And I get it. 
And I get that you don't want to go and just start paying for it because it sets a precedent. Forgive me while I wax poetic, but it feels like we're choosing a battle and we're sending in child soldiers. Because at the end of the day, I'm not losing nearly as much as a teacher, as the kid who is continuing to go behind and fall behind and fall behind. I was a special educator for 15 years. When a kid is in high school and they are reading below the fifth grade level, the sixth grade level, and that's what we're talking about, they do not graduate. They cannot pass the test. They can't. So it reduces our graduation rate. It reduces our, the employability of our students, of our graduates. It's, I, I get that it's an investment, but just the teacher specialists make a big difference. They close the gap. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Kevin Kintop from Graceville, Maryland. Uh, I am a 19-year veteran administrator with the county. I've been up in front of the commissioners many times, uh, good times, bad times, but we're always here doing the same thing. We're always asking for money. Um, I need to tell you genuinely, you've heard a lot of the thank yous, but really, you guys have supported education tremendously over the last several years, and we can't thank you enough for that. We are very appreciative of that. We right now are in a perfect storm. We have state funding that changed because we're out of COVID now. We have a blueprint that came into play. We have rising fuel costs. We have rising healthcare costs. We have just a perfect storm that's hitting us at this particular moment. And by hitting us, it's hitting you because you're the ones that do hold the purse strings. So when you give us a budget that you gave us, which that five additional million dollars is absolutely tremendous, it still leaves us in this perfect storm having to lose something. The budget process for us starts in October. We start at the school level, at the board level, start looking at what we need. We have meetings, commissioners have been a part of those meetings where we get to tell what our priorities are, what we'd like to see. But then we have to wait and we have to see what that state funding comes in at. We have to wait and see what some of these numbers are. We try to be as open with everything as we can with you guys. But when it comes down to it, we have to make some final last minute decisions. And that's why we have the experts at the board, the uh, superintendent. They have to make tough decisions. I'm not coming to you today asking you to save a particular position because that's not your job. It's the job of the superintendent. She has to decide where those positions are gonna come from to meet the budget and with the board to make that decision. But I am coming to ask that you listen to what everybody's been telling you and, and the criticalness that we're in right now, that we need some additional money so that we don't lose a very, not just very good, an excellent school system. I, am, I moved from Anne Arundel County over here to bring my kids and both my kids started. And for 19 years, I've had two of them go through the system. I'm very proud of the system that they went to. So I ask you just to, to consider that idea that it's not about the positions you're hearing, although that's gonna pull in your heartstrings, but it really is about making sure that we try to fund as much as we can to keep the system up there. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? All right, we'll close the public comment. Oh, you wanna speak? My name is Colton Bollinger. Uh, I'm a senior at Queen Anne's County High School and I'm graduating next Wednesday. Um, the, the two things that I just wanted to bring up were, first that uh, my girlfriend, Sophia, um, while doing uh, both of the language pathways at, at uh, the high school, but the Spanish and the French pathway, um, she was expected to complete both of them by her graduation, uh, which is also next Wednesday. But unfortunately, due to what I believe is uh, budget cuts, um, or maybe not, the, uh, the French teacher is no longer at Queen Anne's County High School, meaning that she was not able to complete the pathway um, and lost out on lots of potential scholarship money. Uh, now, fortunately for her, she received the seal of biliteracy due to some self-studying, which is really great for her. But there was a whole class full of uh, students in the French pathway who weren't able to complete uh, with the designation of uh, a French language completer um, and instead had to go to liberal studies. Uh, so I just think that that's, that's something that should be considered is what maybe students are losing out on. Uh, as well as 
I am completing the engineering pathway here at, at Queen Anne's County High School, and I can speak for my teacher, Mr. Herman, uh, who is, is fantastic and wonderful. However, due to the amount of work that he is expected to do and the amount that he's uh, expected to do for all of his kids, but particularly uh, the seniors completing his capstone class, Engineering Design and Development, uh, he ends up he ends up spending a lot of his personal money uh, and personal resources and time um, trying to support kids throughout that throughout this pathway and, and help them along. And I don't believe that he receives uh, additional compensation, but also I mean also credit, um, as well as the fact that because of a new CNC machine that was uh, obtained by the high school. He is now expected to uh, create an entire new class in the engineering program um, for manufacturing, which is really great, um, except for the fact that he is the only teacher at the high school who does engineering classes year round, um, and one of three who does any engineering classes, the other two um, being Ms. Shingleton, who does the civil engineering, and Mr. Kreis, who does um, introduction to engineering but he's the only teacher able to do digital electronics, uh, aerospace, engineering design development, uh, and principles of engineering. So I just wanna point out uh, the fact that budget cuts and reducing staff uh, will often lead to missed opportunities for students like myself um, and like many of my peers. Thank you. Test, test. Um, so this wraps up um, three nights of a very strong message. Um, I would be remiss if uh, we didn't thank everybody again for their, their passion uh, and their willingness to come and share their stories and their testimonies and concerns about uh, the reading specialist cuts that could possibly be taking place. The other thing that I want to uh, make sure that uh, I mentioned is the appreciation for QAC Channel 7, George and his crew <clears throat> who have uh, covered these meetings so the folks who couldn't be here these three nights could watch it on QAC Channel 7. So George, to you and your crew, thank you very much for everything. All right, so I was, first off, thank you again for everybody coming out. Um, respectful and passionate conversation. Um, it's been great all three nights. Uh, we hear you. Um, but I was really wasn't sure what I was going to say tonight because I used the first night to really um, uh, talk about Kerwin and, and what it really means, what, what it's been at, because, as somebody who sat on the Kerwin Commission. Um, I, I hold a lot of passion about that particular uh, three months of my life. Um, but at the end of the day, and, and I want to first, Colton, one, one thing that's part of Kerwin, that's, in my mind, was the greatest thing that came out of Kerwin was the fact that there was a, a recognition of the, that you need to have both career and college readiness pathways for kids coming up through high school. Um, sadly, We've fallen short on that goal already in my mind because one of the things that was supposed to happen with that is it's gonna dovetail into our local community college and become a dual enrollment situation to where the resources were gonna be there at multiple levels so that you wouldn't have the situation that you were bringing up here tonight. Um, hopefully that gets corrected. I know there's work being done on it. And I know there's also more money that's supposed to be designated for that as Kerwin gets rolled out. So hopefully that does get solved. Um, I'm a huge advocate for dual enrollment in the trades um, and alternative pathways. And Alexis, you segue to what I wanted to talk about. I, I appreciate your comments. You, you came up and you nailed exactly what the problem is. And, and, I, and I did some research since Monday night because I wanted to make sure I had the numbers right. But right now, based on the original Kerwin, and that's with no inflation, that's no COVID effect at all built into it. Queen Anne's County is behind $2 million from what the state's input was supposed to be. So imagine if we had that $2 million in our budget this year 
you all could be home right now eating dinner and not sitting here talking to us. And, and it's something we've got to fight for. The, the Maryland State Education Association, as I'm told in Annapolis when I'm there, is the strongest lobby in the state of Maryland. So I need you guys to help us help you. We need to get to Annapolis and we just, Queen Anne's County, these five commissioners, this group, the, the board, every, we want you to have all the money you need to make these kids successful. But we can't do it alone. It's only five of us. And unfortunately, and Ken, you brought the point up, we're, we're not the right party in Annapolis to get things done all the time. So our voices aren't as loud there. But I know if we've got 30,000 teachers, or however many it is, sitting down there in Annapolis saying, look, our counties are trying, but we need you to live up to your end of the bargain. That's what's happening right now. The state is not living up to their end of the bargain. The deal was made. The county's bought into it. We've been a part of it now for five years, and we're trying to do what we can do. But we need the help from across the bridge. So if you guys can advocate and help us up there, we will certainly get behind you and help you. So, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I recognize some of you from uh, last night and the night before, and thanks for making the trip up here. Um, sir, you're right. We are in a perfect storm. Uh, inflation, I mean, just everything. We represent 50,000 people. So, as, as I'm looking at the budget that you all saw up there, and I'm looking, you know, where, where, do, we, where do we cut? Do we cut the 4-H park? Do we cut parks and rec? Do we cut the library? Do we cut the state's attorney, the board of elections, the health department? No, we don't do that. And, and I, I'm not gonna vote for a property tax increase. So, to, to um, Commissioner Wilson's point, we need your help with the state. We need your help to contact the governor's office, the lieutenant governor's office. The Senate Majority's uh, leader's name is Johnson, and the, uh, the, um, the House of Delegates leader is Adrian Jones. They're good people. They're the ones that are putting the strain on us, and it's coming back to the commissioners when that's not really fair. We're, we're in the same boat. We're all rowing in the same direction. We've got a lot, lots and lots of different departments that are fantastic for our county. We have fantastic parks and recs. We got a fantastic library. Our roads department are just outstanding. Our sheriff protects us. We're not cutting that. We're not going to cut those problems. So I, I leave this uh, and, and uh, Doctor, I really appreciate that you came up and you, you kind of showed us your heart that you're willing to work with Mr. Wilson and, and Mr. Jeff and let's partner. Let, let's, be a, let, let's, let's be a good partner. Thank you. All right. Shannon, I don't know why he was targeting the library like that, but I, you should catch him outside just in case. Um, I did say no. Uh, I don't know. That's not what I heard, but no. uh, you can answer to her outside. That's all I know. Uh, did I say no? I, I want to thank everybody that came out all the nights, in particular um, the teachers who I think when you're presenting and you're telling the story of not just what you do, but your kids and the effect on them, um, it's helpful to hear. Um, we don't you know, we don't get to see what you do every day, and uh, we don't get to see the impact on, that you have on the kids every day. I mean, I have kids in the school system, so I see impact, but it's, it's different than the story that you guys tell. And um, you've all done it in a very respectful way and a passionate way that I think makes a huge difference. Um, we sometimes have people who speak before us with a lot of um, indignation, hyperbole, and that doesn't really carry a message the same as when you, when you tell the story that you need to tell. And so I commend you all for doing that because I think it was very helpful for us to understand more um, the impact of what we're talking about. So thank you all for, for your time coming out. I think, uh, Dr. Salins, I, I, I want to thank you again. I, I hate these meetings because I don't think it's fair to have you guys coming up in, in lack of better terms, begging the county for money. Uh, and, and, I, and I apologize for that. But Jack's 100% correct. The state made this deal. 
you know, we're, we're, we're sticking to the deal and we're doing our portion of it and the state needs to come up with theirs. With that being said, there's things that we will try and do and we've got some work to do. Uh, it might be rough next year, possibly the year after, but we're going to get there. Once we get this worked out, we're going to get there and get it where it should be. So I feel confident in that. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 never, I never look at the glass as half empty. It's always got to be half full. So thank you for coming out. And uh, we look forward to better times and better news. Thank you.